our kids church has continued to meet every Sunday and throughout the week online. Part of the fun that we have at Kids Church is us being able to provide watch parties on Facebook. Now our watch parties involve a full service, so it's exactly what the kids will experience on a Sunday. They get to come and they get to do worship, they get to learn about Jesus, and they get to learn a memory verse. It's part of our Sunday experience. We love it. It's our favorite part of Sundays, and the families and kids get to be involved. We have services at 9 a.m. for early childhood, so you can bring your babies all the way to four-year-olds if you like, or you can come join us at our 11 a.m. service for elementary kids. We provide a full service, so please come join us. Kids Church Online would not be possible without our amazing team of volunteers. Hey kids, we love you, we miss you. Hi, this is Teacher Rochelle from the Church on the Way, and I wanted to remind you how special and loved you are by God. We hope to see you soon. God bless you. Our volunteers have done such an amazing job in staying connected with our families during this season. Even though physically we cannot meet, we have had the most amazing volunteers. They have been doing encouraging videos and posting them through our Facebook and our Instagram so that our families still see that familiar face, so that our kids still have that connection with our teachers. This is teacher Cecilia. And this is teacher Oscar. Meet our friend. Donatello! Hi Donatello! Not only have they been um, creating these encouraging videos, they've also been joining our Facebook watch parties on Sundays and interacting with our families. So it's just been really amazing to see our families and our volunteers come together. And because our partnership with parents is more important than ever, we are discovering new opportunities to come alongside our families as our kids continue to grow in their relationship with Jesus. Parents, during this time, you guys are doing amazing. I know that it's been so busy, but we have loved seeing you guys engage in the comments during watch parties, posting activities that your kids are doing, and really building that community for our kids' church. Nothing at all can ever separate us from God's love. Romans 8.39 one story I do want to share is about one of our preschool families, a mom that I talked to was telling me that her four-year-old has gotten so excited about church during this season. Every Sunday, she can't wait to worship. She's learning the songs, practicing during the week and engaging in that time. And because of that, this mom was telling me that her and her husband have felt the need for their faith with the Lord to grow deeper. I love that God is moving through a four-year-old to bring the entire family closer to God. But we want to encourage you to make your child's faith a priority. Please use the online resources that we have so that your child can continue in this season to grow in their faith with Jesus. So visit our website today and join us. We can't wait to see you. Hi, I'm Pastor Danny McEntee, and welcome to our Pause Devotional of the Week. I'm really excited to be here, if you can't tell. So one thing I've heard ad nauseum over this past year are phrases like this, let's cancel 2020, or can we forget 2020 ever even happened? Now, I can certainly sympathize with these sentiments. Okay, trust me, I've had my share of quarantine-induced moments where I was crying into my ice cream wearing the same pair of sweatpants for more days than I'd like to admit. But I'm truly convinced that the cancel 2020 mentality is the furthest possible thing from a biblical response. In our reading this week, we come to Paul's letter to the Philippians. Paul wrote this letter literally while he was sitting in prison, a prisoner of Rome. And even in prison, he's rejoicing. Why is he able to rejoice? It's because the secret of his joy was the single mind. Okay, what does that mean exactly? What's the single mind? It's a mind that is set on living solely for Christ and the gospel. It's that attitude that says, makes no difference what happens to me as long as Christ is glorified and the gospel is shared with others. In Philippians 1.21, he even writes, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So Paul rejoices in spite of his circumstances because he knew that his circumstances were doing incredible things for the kingdom of God. 
First of all, his circumstances strengthen the gospel in the fellowship of the gospel. Secondly, in Philippians 1.11, he states that his circumstances advance the furtherance of the gospel. In fact, the words he uses here at the heading of these verses is, Paul's chains advance the gospel. Lastly, his seemingly unfortunate circumstances increased the faith of the gospel. So what does it mean to strengthen the fellowship of the gospel? First of all, we need to understand that the word fellowship means to have in common. Now, as Christians, we throw this word fellowship around a lot. Oh, let's go to the courtyard and have coffee and fellowship. But Christian fellowship is much more than simply hanging out and sharing a meal together. In true Christian fellowship, we have this one vital thing in common, and that is the possession of eternal life through Christ Jesus. We also have the fellowship of the Spirit and the participation in Christ's sufferings. So for believers in Christ, the fellowship of the gospel is this deep, personal, shared commonality through our sufferings, our joys, and our salvation. It is this connection that cannot be broken no matter the physical separation. And we see that in Paul's letter to the Philippians, it is entirely possible to be close to people spiritually and far from them physically. Which doesn't that kind of sum up the status of Christ's church in 2020? So thankfully, None of us in this country are imprisoned because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But surely many of us have felt imprisoned and isolated in our homes from any real physical connection with others. Paul writes to his friends in the same situation, I have you in my mind, I have you in my heart, and I have you in my prayers. Now I accept these words from Paul as a challenge not only as a pastor, but also simply as a follower of Christ, to be intentional about keeping fellow believers in my mind, in my heart, and in my daily prayers. And personally, I find his words convicting. They remind us and challenge us that instead of living in a spirit of grumbling about current circumstances, which is really easy to do, we can choose instead to rejoice in this difficulty and and in this season that has been presented to us. We can, as believers of Christ Jesus, choose to see 2020 not as some curse, but as a gift. And if we remain of the single mind, we get to use that gift to strengthen the fellowship of the gospel between believers. We get to use that gift to advance the furtherance of the gospel in a hurting and broken world. And we get to use that gift to increase the faith of the gospel within our own hearts. I hope this was an encouragement to you today. I hope you have an incredible week. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to see more videos like this, you can go subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook, and check out our website. Um, Subscribe to our email list if you'd like to get this video, pause devotional in email version. Some of us like to read the words instead of watch them. If that's you, subscribe to our email list to get weekly pause devotional and we, we encourage you to join our pause reading plan. That's on our website too. Have an awesome day.
morning. Welcome to the Church on the Way. <laughs> Welcome to the Church on the Way. You already said that. Yes, you did. Hey, we're so happy that you are gathering with us today. My name is Ben. I'm Danny. And if you're watching on our website, we invite you to head on over to Facebook Live and YouTube. That is where the party is at on Facebook. You can comment on the service, ask for prayer in the comments, and say hello to your friends virtually. On YouTube, you can do all of that and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can watch past services, weekly devotionals, and Friday worship videos. Yes, good, you got them all. Thank you. We have a great service for you today. We can't can't wait for you to join us with worship, prayer, and a great word from the president of Foursquare, Pastor Randy Remington. Yes, can't wait. Listen, if this is your first time here, also thank you for joining us. We would love for you to take a second, fill out a digital connect card, and we'll send you a $5 Starbucks gift card. Now, one of the things we miss the most about our in-person gatherings is being able to see people's faces, which is why we love our digital courtyard. It's a virtual place to make connections with others before and after Sunday services on Zoom. So just text the word courtyard to 97,000. We'll send you a Zoom link, or you can go to the digital courtyard page on our website at the conclusion of service today and pop in one of those groups there. We'd love to see your face. Amazing. Hey. Do you need prayer? If you need prayer, please be sure to fill out a prayer request form on our website. You can always call or email our church offices because we have incredible staff working remotely for you today. And don't forget, every Wednesday we are still partnering with the LA Dream Center to feed our community. Our grocery giveaway continues to take place from 2.30 to 3.30 every single Wednesday in our church parking lot. And it's not just for our neighborhood. If you find yourself or someone you know in need of groceries, we want to bless you. So please come and receive. And there's also a drive through option now. Yes. yes. Hey, if you're like us and are a family uh, that has preschool kids and elementary kids, do not forget that we have uh, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. kids services on the Facebook page, Church on the Way Kids. Check that out. And as the high school pastor, I want to welcome Rooted Middle School and Satellite Woo! High School students. You. Thank you for joining with us today. We love you. It's true. Mm. We hope you guys have a great service and we'll see you here afterwards. Yep. I would say we are not your typical couple and our date nights are different than most couples would be. We just cherish every time that we're together and whatever we are doing, we're thinking, this is good. Couples need that time to reconnect. Mm -hmm. Stop and think about it. You spend more time with your, with your people at work than you do with your wife. Just this week, we both went to the dentist together. We used the same hairdresser. <laughs> and uh, we, after the dentist, we stopped at Johnny, Johnny Rockets. Rockets, and then we went to Home Depot. I wanted to go someplace really nice, and and him not so much. So by the time that we drove back home, everything kind of nice around home was closed. So we ended up going to Spires, and I was not happy. <laughs> you should tell them what Spires is, though. Well, yeah, Spires is like a Denny's. First time you met my parents. First time. And I spill ice cold water all over him. And he just keeps on going with the conversation and no response. And so my parents still enjoy that story too. And so it's dates with mishaps are memorable for us. Date nights or date times, day or night. As you get older, it's more date days. Date, yeah. <laughs> And we do have busy lives, but I, I think you need to set priorities. And if you're married, then your marriage always has to take top priority. Our connect group, when we were meeting at our home, it was more intimate and we could, you know, share, share, food. share food and fellowship. One of my Zoom questions is, who brought snacks today? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody does. I'm so thankful for the couples that we've met within the body of Christ and even in our wonderful church that uh, God has used to strengthen our marriage. It's good to reconnect because sometimes you just don't get to see people face to face nowadays and to, to Zoom has helped make that happen. Well, hello 
and welcome to the Church on the Way. We are so excited for service this morning. We're going to worship together. We are going to hear um, a message from the Word, and we love having you with us. I want to say hello to the youth and the kids who are joining us as we are being the church everywhere. It's going to be a great day. So last week, last Sunday night, we started our seven week season of prayer and fasting. And I'm telling you, it was amazing to come together in the courtyard. It was awesome. It was messy. It was everything that a prayer movement should be. Hey, if you're registered to come tonight, come join us. If you're not registered to be here in person, you can join us online. You find out that information on our website. Also, every Monday, I'm releasing a prayer video that gives us a focus for the week of prayer and fasting. And you can get that by signing up for our YouTube page and hitting subscriptions. Um, We're going to be praying as a church. We're going to be fasting as a church. We are contending, not just for a finishing and a healing of the COVID-19 season, but of a renewal of the church of Jesus Christ, both at the church on the way and all over our city. So would you pray with me right now? Father, we come before you and we are so thankful that you are preparing our hearts and you're preparing our congregation for something above and beyond anything that we can imagine. So we're going to press in and we're going to pray and we're going to fast and we're going to believe, Lord, that you're moving in our hearts and in our midst, that you're moving in our city and our nation and our world. So over these next few weeks, Lord, I pray that you'd knit our hearts together as you prepare us for what's next. Today, would you engage us, Lord, in worship as we come to you? Would you transform our hearts as we look at the word of God? As we open up our hearts to you, Lord, make us new today and draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together, church. Good morning, church. Let's worship wherever you're joining us for service. Would you join us and sing? Shout if you can. If you've got kids, let them dance in the living room. Wherever you are, let's worship God.
never runs out on me.
where you meet us take us there take me there what you need is just an offering it's right here my life is here and I'll be a living sacrifice for you you're refined the refiner I want to be consumed I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you desire, Lord here's my life, I want to be tried by fire, purified, you take whatever you desire, Lord here's my life.
we give you our lives, we give you our hearts, and we recognize that in this season where we are being tried by fire, where we are experiencing trials and like Peter says, griefs of many kinds, we can either get our eyes on our grief or we can get our eyes on our God. And we choose to get our eyes on you and to welcome, not just put up with, but welcome the refining of your fire that we may be experiencing now, that what the enemy wants to use for destruction and evil, you can take and turn it around and actually use it for our good and for your glory. So God, I pray that we would get our eyes on you, that we would get our hearts on you, and that we would become the people that you're shaping us to be right now for the future of humanity and for the future in eternity. We love you so much, Jesus. We welcome you. We welcome you. Change us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, church, I, I'm so excited today to um, introduce somebody to you. We're going to get back into our series on First Peter Exiles next week. I'll be back preaching. Last week, Mario did a great job unpacking part of First Peter 2. Um, this week, though, I'm going to share a friend with you. Uh, this is a friend who just recently officially became appointed as the Foursquare president. We, as the Church on the Way, belong to a family of churches called the Foursquare Church. Um, about 2,000, 1,800 churches in the United States and tens and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands all over the world. Um, it's a missionary movement that started in the 20s. But Randy Remington is the new president of this movement, this family, this denomination. And I've known Randy for about 30 years. Uh, when I was in Bible college and then as a young pastor, Randy was just a few years ahead of me. And I've never told him this before, but I watched his life and ministry, all of my life and ministry, and used Randy as kind of a North Star. 
Um, pastorally, Randy is a very patient man. He's a very humble man. He is a man of prayer, and he loves and handles the Word of God properly. Uh, he's, a gr- he's a great man. He's a great pastor. He's also personally just a, a good man. He loves his family deeply. Um, he loves, he's a loyal friend. He's a faithful friend. And really, he's one of the people that I would consider a man of God. He's, he's the president of the movement of churches we belong to now. And, and I wanted to introduce him to you. I wanted you to be able to know who he was, and he'll be around for a while. This, this term he serves is five years, and it could go for 10 years. Um, but he's the kind of person that you can learn from and grow from. He's the kind of person uh, that really reflects the Lord's heart. And mainly, before he comes and shares the word with us, I wanted to lead us as a church to pray for him. Not just today, not just right now, but to continue to pray for him as he leads this movement of churches that is reaching our world right now. I believe that we live in a critical time where God is showing up and doing new things through his church and bringing outpouring and harvest. And Randy has a a pretty weighty responsibility. I just want to lift him up. Would you join me as we do that? Heavenly Father, thanks for Randy Remington. (laughs) Thank you for our new president of our, of our Foursquare movement, our family of churches, our denomination. Lord, it's not about the denomination, but it's about the people that the churches of this denomination are going to be reaching. Lord, we don't exist to be separatists from the other churches, but we are a part of the body of Christ. Lord, we're a unique expression of that, that body. And so I pray as Randy leads the church, as he leads us, not just organizationally, but spiritually, as he leads us to be people in churches of prayer, as he leads us to be open to the Holy Spirit and eager for the Spirit's power, as he leads us to make a difference in a world that's broken and desperately needs you. Lord, I pray that our hearts as pastors and leaders and even as churches, the church on the way, that we would be ready to be led into those places. Lord, that we would be a part of a body that's unified, that wants to reach our world, that cares about the broken people that you care about. Lord, I pray for great strength and wisdom as Randy leads in this season. Protect him and his family. Lord, allow him to just grow even closer to you. We cover him with our prayers. We cover him, Lord, with our words, and we lift him up and support him. Thank you that he's come to bring the word of God to us today. Let us listen and be transformed as he shares the word with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, open your hearts to welcome Randy Remington. Good morning, Church on the Way family. This is a privilege to get to come to you today and um, share the word of God with you and encourage your hearts. Uh, I've known about your church like everyone has. Um, You have been a faithful presence in this community and a significant voice in the body of Christ for a long, long time. But my special affection for this location is that I was ordained into ministry right here in this spot here in the sanctuary. And so my wife and I began our pastoral journey with hands being laid on us um, as we had a convention in this house. And so there is a rich legacy of ministry that is I'm sure rehearsed again and again for you every time somebody comes here to speak from the outside especially. But I just want you to know I feel a deep debt of gratitude for all that you have given and the ways that you have prayed and the ways that you have served over the years. Our larger Foursquare family and as well the body of Christ. And I also want to say, not because I feel obligated to or because it's required, Um, of me, but I just want to say how much I love your pastors, Tim and Deborah. And to be a pastor today um, is unique in its challenges, but they bear up under the weight of the responsibility um, that they have been given by Jesus. Um, The assignment that they're stewarding as pastors here, they do it with joy, they do it with faith, they do it with hope, they do it with love. And you can tell a lot about somebody by the way they speak about the people they serve. And when I hear the heart of your pastor, it really is the heart of a a pastor. It's the heart of a shepherd. It's someone who truly loves you. And the thing I love about Tim and Deborah is that they are who they appear to be. Um, What we see on the outside is really true of them in the inside. There's congruency there. And so I'm so thankful that God has put um, wise, 
loving shepherds who are integrous and faithful followers of Jesus themselves um, to lead in this season. And so thank you for your um, love and, and support of them as well. And it's a joy to partner together in this season in what God is doing literally in our communities, in the world, um, our nation, um, in particular, our Foursquare family. And it's a unique um, affinity. It's a unique um, joining that we um, have together in this this family, and, and we're thankful for it. It's created a lot of great partnership and opportunities for us, and I look forward to continuing that in the future. I know that Tim has been um, leading you through a study in the book of First Peter. He's um, really a gifted teacher, and he is unpacking the mysteries of the Bible to you weekly. Um, breaking down the complex and making it simple. Um, so I'm going to leave the heavy things to him. I'm going to leave all the heavy lifting to him, and I'm going to go for some low-hanging fruit this morning. I want to encourage you from just a, a, a very familiar passage of Scripture in the Bible, but I think it really speaks to our hearts and our minds um, in this moment that we are living culturally, just our moment in history, this generational moment, I think it's something that is really needed and something that is really to be contended for in our lives as followers of Jesus. And it has to do with the condition of our heart. It has to do with the well-being um, of our mental life and thoughts. Uh, it really has to do with the peace of God specifically. And a lot of times just navigating life compresses a lot of stuff within us. There's a lot of sorrow. There's a lot of things that um, are impacting us that we just work our way through and maybe we're aware of and oftentimes not aware of. And then there's these moments where they just kind of manifest or we're made aware of those things. And I remember once I had a project I needed to do for a program I was in in higher education a few years ago, and I made a, an appointment with a research librarian, and I went to this library and met this person for the first time, and at this man's feet was laying this beautiful golden retriever that had a service vest on it. And I know you're not supposed to do this. I know you're not supposed to say, hey, what does your dog do? But I did. I went there, and I said, hey, what does your dog do for you? And he said, well, I'm a Vietnam vet, and I have post-traumatic stress syndrome, and this dog actually helps me to be calm. Um, when my anxiousness, when I, I start kind of getting these elevated um, emotions, the, the dog can sense that early on and help kind of head that off. And so if I start getting a little anxious, the dog will just detect that and come and lay at my feet. And if, if, if I start getting a little more anxious, the dog will actually kind of catch my eyes and make eye contact with me and look at me right in the eyes. And, and if I'm really starting then to... Um, come undone, the, the dog will actually climb up into my lap and nuzzle up against me. And, and so I said, that's, that's brilliant. That's amazing. Um, kind of the way that we can work together and, and how God made animals like that to do that and the capacity for that. So we got on with our project. And after about 10 minutes, this dog gets up and comes over and lays at my feet. And a few minutes later, the dog sits up and just makes eye contact with me. And a few minutes later, no kidding, the dog climbs up into my lap and starts nuzzling me. And the guy says, are you doing OK? And I'm like, apparently not. And I didn't even, I didn't even know maybe something was going on with me. I'm not saying I was dealing with post-traumatic stress, but maybe there was an anxiousness, um, something of uh, an uh, emotional issue going on in me. I wasn't even really aware of. And I guess the question I'm really wanting to ask you today is, we don't have a dog to come lay at your feet and kind of detect anything, but how's your heart doing? Um, how are you doing in the midst of everything externally we're navigating? How's the welfare of your soul? How's, how's your heart? How are your thoughts today? And so I want to come not as a psychologist and not as a counselor, but I just want to come as somebody who truly believes that the word of God is helpful for us, the word of God is life-giving to us, that the Holy Spirit takes the words of the scriptures and reveals Jesus to us in and through them, which brings us to a continual establishment of our lives in a foundation that's firm and, and unshakable and steadfast and unmovable for us in our life. And in Philippians chapter four, verse four, 
These familiar words begin. Rejoice in the Lord always, and I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or worthy of praise, think about these things. And whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Two times peace is referenced in this passage. First, it speaks to the peace of God that will protect your heart and mind. And then it speaks to the God of peace who will always be with you. And so this direct reference to the God of peace and the peace of God as a promise to us. So the scripture is inviting us to a place of residency within a promise of God to live steadfast in a promise that God makes to us in the promise is this, that the peace of God will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And the promise is this, that the God of peace will be with you. Is this a promise that's elusive? Um, is this something that is unattainable? Is this just to tease us with? Or is this something that can truly be lived in? Can I truly be at peace regardless of what's happening out here, what's happening in my control or outside of my control? Is this something that just frustrates me? Or can this truly be a reality for me? Can I truly live as a person of peace? Can I be a peacemaker? Can I make for peace wherever I go? The God of peace, the peace of God. Imagine how much peace God has right now. God is never under duress. God is never under threat. He always has complete control. He, he's not driven. He's not frantic. God doesn't have to learn things that he doesn't know. Um, God doesn't say, you know what just occurred to me? You know, he doesn't have to have a thought that he has never had before because that would imply he needs to know something he didn't know before. That, that imagine if you were God. Your peace, peace is who you are. And this is the promise. That peace can be with you. That peace can surround you. That you can be somebody who doesn't just aspire to something, but you can live in the reality of. And that's my encouragement to us today because I've never yet met anybody that feels like, you know, I just got too much peace. I'm just like, this peace is killing me. I just got too much peace. Couldn't sleep last night. Just had so much peace. Um, we're not usually people like that. We're usually people in pursuit of it. And my simple premise this morning is, is it possible that this is a promise that we can live into and that we can realize and that we can experience? And there's a couple things that's referenced about this peace. First of all, it's of God. So it's trans-circumstantial, it's not tethered to, this is not the peace that comes because we know an end date of a pandemic. This isn't the peace that comes because our child got into the university we were hoping they would. This isn't the peace that comes because I got the raise and the promotion at work. This isn't the peace that comes because that uh, boy or that girl likes me in the way that I like them. This, this is not the peace that's tied to anything circumstantial. This is divine in its origin and its nature. It's of God. It comes from God and it is of God. And so peace is unique because not only is it divine, but it's one of the weapons that God has in his arsenal to protect our lives with. So I don't think we often think of peace as a protector, that God wars over our life for us in his peace, that his peace stands like a guardian around our minds and guarding our hearts. So to be somebody who walks in peace and, and lives in the peace of God and as at peace with God is probably one of the most countercultural ways we can live in the world today. 
when we see, see so much strife, when we see so much division, when we see so much discord and acrimony and polarization and hostility and division, that we're people of peace. It's counter to the culture that we're living in today. But this is kingdom culture. Wherever Jesus is established and enthroned, peace is the condition of the land. That wherever Jesus is enthroned in a heart, peace is there. Isaiah put it this way, that he would be called mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, and of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Where Jesus is governing, where Jesus is ruling, where Jesus is reigning, there is an increase of peace that will never end. This is about living in the kingdom of God. It's, it's in this world, but not of this world. It's being able to go into the world because we live within the realities of King Jesus and his ruling and reigning in our hearts and lives. So we're to be people of peace. Doesn't mean that we don't navigate concerns and challenges and, and have to process things and be honest before God about the condition and the reality of our trials and difficulties or even sufferings but it is something that can be experienced beyond circumstances being ordered in the way that we would like them to. So this phrase says in verse six, do not be anxious about anything. Do you know that Kindle, their online version of um, library that Amazon has, out of their hundreds of thousands, if not millions of books online, they have multiple translations of the Bible online. And every time the Bible passage is, a Bible passage is highlighted or underlined on Kindle, it keeps record of it. And version, a Bible app, the most used Bible app in the world, um, does the same thing. And both of those will say this. They will say that the most highlighted, underlined verse in the Bible is, do not be anxious for anything, which just tells me something. It tells me the people are grabbing for a promise like that that's needed. Interesting enough, Amazon would say out of all of its online literature, the most underlined sentence in all of their online literature is from the second book of The Hunger Games. And it's this statement, because sometimes things happen to people and they're not equipped to deal with them. Think about that for a moment. So here's stuff, it happens to us, and I have no resources within myself to deal with that. And then we step over here into the word of God and it's like, I don't have any more control of my circumstances here than I did there, but I've got a promise that I don't have to be anxious for anything. Do you know that the condition of the day in which we live is, is one of anxiety? It's actually one of high anxiety. It's like normative to be fearful, to be angered, to be enraged, to be stressed out, to be unstable and uncertain. Sociologists and psychologists tell us today that the average teenager exhibits the same level of anxiety as the average psychiatric patient did in the 1950s. So they used to institutionalize people for an anxiety level that is the norm for teenagers today, and there's a lot of reason for that, but the idea here is that there's a pandemic within the pandemic, and it's anxiousness, that there's this rising level of, of anxiety, and so it may be common, but is it meant to be the norm for a follower of Jesus? And that's where I wanna to get to for a moment, because Jesus said directly to us in John 16, I've told you all of these things, not because I want you to be troubled, I've told you all of these things so that in me you would have peace. And I want you to take heart. I've overcome the world. John 14 says, peace I live with you, leave with you, and my peace I give you. I don't give peace like the world gives. So don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. Now, I, I want to acknowledge, I feel like I just want to take a moment and acknowledge something, that there are, there are other contributing factors to why somebody could have high levels of anxiety, and I want to acknowledge that. I mean, we are not Gnostics. We are integrated beings. We are physical people and spiritual people and intellectual and, and emotional people, our soul and spirit and body. We're, 
they're not disconnected from one another. We're, we're, we're holistic in the sense of how we experience life and process and one relates to the other. And we know there are biological factors. Sometimes we're just, maybe it's a dietary issue or an issue of rest. And we know the story of Elijah in the Bible when he was intensely under pressure and, and exhausted and had high, high and low lows. And, and he thought he just wanted God to kill him and he just wanted to die. And an angel shows up and makes a cake of coals and shakes him and says, you, you need to eat and then sleep. It's like, I, that's like a life verse for me. Eat some cake and take a nap. Just that's like, a, sometimes that's a good prescription. I'm just like, you know, you just need a fussy baby, put it down for a nap. That's going to take care of the deal. Sometimes you just need to rest. Are you, are you in balance? Are you exercising? Are you, are you sleeping? And but there are also neurological issues that can come into play as well, that sometimes our brains aren't producing the right chemicals. And, and I want to differentiate between what is the most common illness, mental illness in, a, in America, especially today, and that's anxiety disorder. And so I'm, I'm talking not about mental illness. I'm talking about just mental health. And, and I wanna be careful to differentiate that because oftentimes there's a stigma that comes with mental illness. And if we think that there's a stigma attached to that, we won't ask for help. We won't seek help in the ways that we need it. And I wanna show grace and empathy and concern um, for anything that's happening in somebody's life that could be just a neurological issue and, and you need to get assistance, professional and medical help for that. Somebody once said, it's not a sin to be sick. It's okay to not be okay in the sense of saying, I need help. And just as we would physically need medical help, that there's opportunities to get help in those ways as well. And if you're not free to admit that, you won't seek help and reach out. And, and I, I just wanna say as the church and a church like this, that is filled with love and care and grace and believes in the healing power of the gospel, but also understands the wisdom of self and, and, and good care with people that can help us at times. But I wanna just talk more about just the general condition of life. That's where I'm aiming at, just the normal realities of life that we deal with. And there's some prerequisites that I wanna finish with that Paul gives in this section of scripture. So, so why do some people walk in peace and others don't? Why, is it a promise for a few and not the whole? And so I want us to, to dial in on a couple of things that are not just like do this, this, and this, and then that will happen but it's the posture we take, it's the stance we take, it's, it's the way that we lay hold of, um, even in faith to experience what Jesus has provided for us. And so embedded in the text that we read are these promises, but, but this promise of peace is only experienced because it's based on something else. And so there's these series of commands that Paul gives, and these commands are addressed to our will. They're aimed at the will. And so basically what Paul is saying is, I want you to make some choices. You've got some decisions to make in these moments when you're about to be anxious. Um, to make a choice is the most fundamental of our human freedoms, that, that you can choose how you respond to circumstances and difficulties and trials. Viktor Frankl, who wrote Man's Search for Meaning, who was the famous Holocaust survivor, um, talked about how some people gave in to despair and died and others made it through. And he said the primary reason why those who made it through did was because they made a decision that they were not going to become the evil that was being done to them. They weren't going to respond in kind to the indignity and to the, to the evil ways they were being, the heinous behavior that they were subjected to. They, they made a choice. I'm gonna forgive you. I'm gonna believe there's still hope for a future. That there's a decision that they made and it got them through. You can always choose how you respond to the circumstances of your life and to the treatment of others towards you that might even be beyond your control. And so I wanna reference four quick things, if I could, not just as a simple formula, but just our posture, our, our, our steps of faith we're taking in these moments. The first is this, rejoice in the Lord. This, this is a simple statement that maybe sounds churchy, but to rejoice in the Lord means to be joyful again and again and again in God. 
Rejoice in the Lord always. And then it's like Paul saying, I, I think I probably should say this again. Rejoice. Because I don't know if you really believed it, but I mean it. Rejoice. Do you know that the opposite of joy is not sadness? The opposite of joy is hopelessness and despair. That's the opposite of joy. And with God, we are never without hope. And so there's a basis for our rejoicing because it's in the Lord. It's not in my circumstances changing, and it's not in my strength or ability. And so when you think about the context, because whenever we talk about anxiety and don't worry and don't fear, don't, don't be anxious, I mean, if those were just my words, you would have reason to doubt them. But these are the Apostle Paul's words. And he's sitting in a prison cell. And we know that in Rome, he's at the end of his life, and he's writing to people outside of the prison, don't be anxious. Usually the people in prison are getting the letter saying, hang in there. And he's writing the letter saying, hang in there. I mean, here's a guy that when he was ordained, hands were laid on him, and God said to the person laying hands on him, prophesy over him. Tell him the things he must suffer for my name's sake. How would you like that to be the beginning of your ministry career? You're going to suffer greatly for the gospel. And he did. And it's culminating in imminent death and martyrdom. And he's sitting in a prison cell and he's saying, rejoice. We were, I mean, we'll never top his story. Because when you say, don't be anxious, Jesus literally said in Matthew 6, don't worry. And we're not going to top Jesus's story. Because we always want to qualify those kind of commands with our own experiences. Well, you don't understand. I mean, we don't do that with other commands. When the Bible says, don't murder, we don't go, come on. Expect me to go my whole life. And, but don't worry, and suddenly we get defensive. Don't be anxious, we get defensive. And Paul says, this is what I want you to do instead. I want you to rejoice in the Lord. And we're not going to overcome his circumstances. But when you begin to praise God, when you just begin to magnify God, and you reframe your circumstance in light of his goodness, in light of his faithfulness, in light of his glory and, and truth, it takes the preoccupation of ourself and it shifts the focus and puts it on God. It interrupts this cycle of hyper-focusing on me and how's this affecting me? And it, it reminds us again that there's an enthroned God in heaven, that there is one who is above all things. There is one who is not limited by anything here, holds all things in his hands, holds the kings and the rulers of the day in his hands. And that's why we praise God. That's why we begin worshiping in one heart. We, we lift up our voices and we, we say, God, you're bigger. You're bigger than all of this. And it reframes our life in the right place. It, it just sets the focus. And Paul is saying, I want you to be people who perfect the art of praise. It's your stance. And it's not just trying to counter with just a, another narrative, but it's rooted in the bigness of God. And sometimes we hyper-focus on things that replace the bigness of God, and they become exaggerated, and we lose sight of who God is. Kind of a corny old story, but years ago, I was reading in a book by Max Lucado, and he was telling this story. It was a, actually an excerpt from a newspaper article in San Antonio, and this guy had a bird named Chippy, a parakeet that was in a little cage, and his wife had been gone for the weekend and was coming back, so he was cleaning up the house, and he noticed that Chippy's bird cage was all messy, so he was vacuuming, and he stopped, and he unhooked the hose, and he opened the cage, and he started cleaning up all the seeds and droppings and feathers, and the phone rang. He said he just turned for a moment, and he heard this <laughs> sound, and he looked, and Chippy was gone. So he panicked. He turned off, the, turned off the vacuum cleaner. He ripped open the canister, and he saw these two little eyeballs sticking out at him, just covered in dirt and junk. So he runs into the bathtub, turns on the faucet, and just sticks the bird under the faucet. And then he just sees this little skeleton in his hands, and he grabs the blow dryer and just starts blowing it. And then he brings Chippy back and just puts Chippy on the perch. So a few weeks later, the reporter was asking kind of a follow-up question. He said, well, how's Chippy doing? And he said, you know, he just doesn't sing as much as he used to do. You know, it's kind of like one minute I'm just sitting on my perch, singing my little chippy songs, life's good, and then boom, I'm just sucked in, blown over, drowned, and 
I don't know what hit me and I lose my song. Christians historically have always sang their way through, sang their way through the night, sang their way through the desert, sang their way through the prison, sang their way through the praises of God. The devil's job is not to get you to do bad things. The devil's job is to get you to take your eyes off of Jesus, to get you to hyper-focus on the reality of circumstances at the expense of the reality to who he is. Your praise will be equal to your view of God. And unless we have a right view of God, we will not have a right view of anything else. And sometimes the lack of peace in our life tells me I've lost my focus. Jesus isn't ruling and reigning in that area of my life. Praise shifts the focus. When we come to this literal statement, don't lose sight of what God has done. Don't lose sight of who he is. The second thing is pray your emotions. In verse six, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation. So this is going to work in any situation. So whatever you come up with as a, as a context, this works in this situation. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. That's an interesting statement because several other times that statement is used, present your request. When the angel showed up to the shepherds in Bethlehem, they said, let's go see this thing that was presented to us. Most people see a baby. We know there's more than a baby going on here. Something has been revealed. And Paul's saying, when you come to pray, don't just pray your circumstances. Pray the emotion under those circumstances. Present that to God. What's this? What's the emotion fueling this? Go deeper. Present that to God. I prayed for a young man once. Well, not a young man. He was in his 40s, never been married. And he said, would you pray for me that I would meet a woman? I want to get married. And I go, yeah, but what's, what else is going on? And, and he kind of broke down. He goes, my family thinks I'm a loser. I feel like a failure, like nobody will ever want me. And underneath all of this was this pain of rejection, of loneliness, of feeling like a failure in the eyes of his family. And it's like, would you pray for me to have a wife? But what if, what if the issue is, God, I feel alone. God, I feel rejected. That's what Paul's saying. Go there. Present that. This is what I'm really feeling. As a young pastor, at the age of 27, my wife and I started our first church. And I used to think I had to have these profound answers to people when they brought their troubles to me. And, and but the complexity of people's issues and challenges, and they would share what's going on. And I realized how they, like that bin of experience was empty I was trying to reach into. And you know, I just listen and think, well, good luck with all that, you know, because it's like, whoa, above my pay grade. But one of the things I learned eventually was it wasn't about me having profound things to say. It was about profound listening. That sometimes just having somebody who listens, there's something therapeutic just in that. Somebody cares. We have a God who can answer to the need, but we also have a God who says, would you tell me about that? because I, I care enough to listen. Prayer is a dialogue. We're listening to God as well as speaking, but imagine a God who says, sit down, just slow it down. Let's, let's unpack that a little bit. What's going on there? T tell me about that. That's the kind of prayer, a prayer that manages your emotion, a prayer that gets to that level. The third thing, think about what you think about. So remember the context, anxiety versus peace. And what Paul is saying is, I want you to choose what you're really musing on, dwelling on, engaging your thoughts on. You can actually reshape and train your brain to function a certain way. And nowhere in the Bible does it say whatever is fearful, whatever is ugly, whatever is hostile, whatever, think on those things. It's no, whatever is good and whatever is lovely, whatever is a good report. It doesn't mean we deny reality and hide our head in the sand. But what am I going to meditate on? What do I dwell on and turn and churn over and over again in my thoughts? Most of what is driving anxiety is not based on truth. That actually is part of the research about anxiety. It's about hypotheticals. It's about what might happen. It's not about reality. Um, 
Most of what we worry about never happens, we're being told. 40% of what we worry about never comes to pass. 30% of what we worry about happened in the past and I can't change it. 10% of what I've worried about is related to health, which is interesting because the more worry we worry, the worse our health gets. 8% um, of what we worry is really legitimate, what we worry about. But even then, my worrying can't change that. Jesus said, who of you by worrying can affect one thing just by worrying? The scripture says in Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast because they trust you. Think on these things. Dwell on them. You have the power to think about what you think about. You take stock. Take an analysis. You're the gatekeeper of your mind. Your intellect can only take you so far. Your intellect and reasoning. The devil wants to destroy your mind through this endless reasoning process, trying to rationalize and reason and figure everything out. If you ever worn yourself out at night, almost to a sleepless state, trying to figure it out. And the promise is we can have a peace that puts our mind at rest, that will allow us to sleep well, because I don't have to have everything figured out. My mind is set on him. And when we come to those moments of solitude, it's not so that all of our feelings of insecurity and all the th things that stress us can come flooding up. It's just because we're shifting. We're putting our thoughts on that which is true, that which is good, that which is a lovely and of a good report. So whatever the mind repeats, it retains. We learn that from neurologists who tell us that what we repeat, we remember because there's this neuroplasticity to our brain that it's not set in stone, it's plastic, that we can reshape neural pathways through the repetition of certain thoughts and actions. And that's why the scripture says, do think this way. It affects your soul, it affects your life, it affects your well-being. And then the last thing, real simply, seek righteousness. Two ways maybe that affect peace. When I'm not right with God, then there's no peace. Repentance is God's gift of saying, would you turn around? Would you change your mind? Would you, would you come back? Um, there's a passage in Isaiah 32 that says, the fruit of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness will be quietness and confidence forever. Peace is the fruit of righteousness. So when things are right between God and myself, through the blood of Jesus, through the means by which he made available for me to be before him without guilt and shame, I'm at peace. Unless things are right, there can be no peace. Maybe today you just need to bring some things into the light. Maybe there's repentance. Jesus, I'm coming honestly before you. I've said some things. I've acted in some ways. I've, I've treated somebody this way. I went online and I just let her rip, you know, with no concern for consequence or the effect on others. And there's some things that kind of have been turning me away from you and I'm turning back to you. And, and through righteousness, the fruit of righteousness is peace and the effect of righteousness is quietness of the soul and confidence. Maybe there's reconciliation that you need to make with another person because there's no peace because something's unreconciled. In Romans chapter 12, it says, as much as it's possible and as much as it depends on you, live at peace with all people. Do whatever you can to. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We are never more like our Father than when we're making for peace. And so I'm going to ask us to pray. I want to pray with you, and I want to pray for you. And I want us to come before the throne of grace today. And I want us to see the consistency of God and his goodness and his faithfulness, his transcendence, his exalted nature, his power and his goodness. I want us to see the possibility of an exchange today that I can take my heavy sorrow, I can take this kind of broken place of this fearful state and I can exchange that today. I can put on a garment of praise and rejoice. I can shift the burden and put into his hands those things I, were, I was never meant to carry. I can go deep and just bring all that honestly before the Lord. I can change what I'm fueling my mind with and 
and redirect my thoughts and intentionally begin to meditate on that which gives me life. And I can come to you, Father, today through the blood of Jesus, and I can seek rightness and relationship with others as much as it's possible, as much as it depends on me. God, I pray that today that there would be the reality of a promise lived out, laid hold of, not just something out there aspirational to tease us with, but something that's true, that the peace of God truly can be our portion today, that we can be people of peace in a world that lacks it, in a peace that's false in its establishment and fleeting and circumstantial. Jesus, you come and give a peace that the world doesn't give. And God, I speak your peace over your people today. I speak your peace over this house. I speak your peace over this church family, over all those listening, over their homes and families. God, may your peace be established. May you guard them and may they go forth with joy and may they be led forth with peace, go out with joy and be led forth with peace into this week in front of them in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've responded to the Lord this morning and made the decision to follow Jesus, you've made the most important decision of your life. And you are not meant to walk this journey alone. Please text TRUST to 97000 and someone trusted will reach out to you and take you to your next steps. This is an exciting journey and we want to celebrate it with you. Yes. Now before we say goodbye, we'd like to ask you to do four things. Mm -hmm. First of all, visit our website and subscribe to our email list to get notifications and weekly pause plan pastoral devotionals as well as downloading our pause Bible reading plan and read along in the Bible with us. Absolutely. Hey, number two, stay connected, get connected. Find your place at the church on the way by joining a fall small group. Yay! Sign ups begin today. today. Today, go to the website and sign up for a small group today. Three, give. Giving is one of the various ways in which we worship God. The Bible said that God, God loves those who give with joy. So to give, you can do three different ways. Text TCOTW to 77977. You can visit the Give page on our website or write a check and mail it in. Lastly, Lastly I'll do the last one. Go for it. Come hang out with us. Yes. We really miss seeing one another and miss meeting new faces, which is why we're so excited about our digital courtyard. Digital courtyard. On Zoom. They're happening right before and immediately after services, and we'd love to connect and see you. So check out the website, the Digital Courtyard page, or text Courtyard to 97000, and we'll text you a link, and you can zoom on in to the group. <laughs> While we're on the topic of hanging out, we want you to remind you that we're having our Sunday nights of prayer and worship, not on Zoom, but in person tonight and for the next five consecutive Sundays, we will gather outside in the church courtyard at 7 p.m. with masks, appropriate social distancing, of course, for a time of corporate prayer and worship. If there's limited seating, so go to our website, click on the link on our Instagram bio to sign up and join us for our uh, prayer nights, virtually via Facebook and on our website or in person in the courtyard. Make sure you register for that because we have limited seating, but if you can't make it for whatever reason, you can always join us online. Go to our website. You can watch it on Facebook or you can watch it on our website. That way you can still be a part of the corporate prayer. We'd love to see you there. We're super excited and we hope you have an amazing week. Awesome. Until next time, take care. God bless. say we are not your typical couple and our date nights are different than most couples would be. We just cherish every time that we're together and whatever we are doing we're thinking this is good. Couples need that time to reconnect. Mm -hmm. Stop and think about it. You spend more time with your, with your people at work than you do with your wife. Just this week we both went to the dentist together. We used the same hairdresser <laughs> and uh, we after the dentist we stopped at Johnny, Johnny Rockets. Rockets, and then we went to Home Depot. I wanted to go someplace really nice, and and 
him not so much. So by the time that we drove back home, everything kind of nice around home was closed. So we ended up going to Spires. And I was not happy. <laughs> you should tell them what Spires is though. Well, yeah, Spires is like a Denny's. First time you met my parents. First time. And I spill ice cold water all over him. And he just keeps on going with the conversation and no response. And so my parents still enjoy that story too. And so it's dates with mishaps are memorable for us. Date nights or date times, day or night. As you get older, it's more date days. Date, yeah. <laughs> And we do have busy lives, but I, I think you need to set priorities. And if you're married, then your marriage always has to take top priority. Our connect group, when we were meeting at our home, it was more intimate and we could, you know, share, share, food. share food and fellowship. One of my Zoom questions is, who brought snacks today? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody does. I'm so thankful for the couples that we've met within the body of Christ and even in our wonderful church that uh, God has used to strengthen our marriage. It's good to reconnect because sometimes you just don't get to see people face to face nowadays and to, to Zoom has helped make that happen.